the entrepreneurial journey podcast we're talking business and building a culture that's kick-ass where we make it happen grab your seat let's have a blast at the entrepreneurial journey podcast Big failure of technology uh but i'm Delighted and quite frankly relieved to welcome uh, Don Chapman and Elliot Chapman, who are serial entrepreneurs and also brothers. Um, they don't like job titles, so I'm just going to introduce them as co founders and go straight over to Elliot and go, Elliot, what do you guys actually do? Uh, firstly, hello. Um, thank you for all the perseverance there. Um, so I'm I'm Elliot. I am one half of uh, of Chapman Capital, um, who owns Social Chaps as well as a number of other agencies, which I'm sure we'll get into. Yeah. Um, but Social Chaps was the first agency that Dom and I started uh, about four or five years ago, and Social Chaps is a lead generation agency, or was a lead generation agency, is now a growth partner agency. So that's we'll talk about how that sort of naturally evolved over the last couple of years from the lead generation space into what is now a more well-rounded 360 view of lead generation, not just lead generation, but how do we then close the loop as well, cool. which is what Tom and I are, are doing. Um, and it is a blend of technology. Some of the technology is our technology. Um, methodologies which Dom and I have accumulated over the last four or five years, and people. We sort of yeah. marry up the three of all those things. Yeah, wonderful, amazing. Dom, what's it like working with your brother? Uh, terrible. No, <laughs> no. It's, <laughs> it's. I think it's it's a very unique thing, and a lot of people say to us, like, oh, I can I can work with a sibling, I can do this with a sibling, but I think the the relationship that we've had and we've also experienced what it's like with different types of business partners, mm. um, as we've both been in previous ventures, we we enjoy working together. We we definitely balance each other out um, and we bring completely different skill sets, as you previously <laughs> saw. Um, <laughs> um, trying to get on any form of tech for L is, is a struggle. Um, <laughs> Whereas if you put a you know if you put a financial spreadsheet in front of me, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna know what to do. So we we balance each other out in a in in terms of skill sets, which works extremely well. But we also have the same sort of vision and sort of views on how to how to run business, how to treat people, and how to treat sort of customers. So uh, yeah, it works well, I'd say. Yeah, brilliant. Right, I really want to dive into two things. One is this you know you don't like job titles tell me a yep. little bit about that first so dom and i sort of i guess preface the that question with our relationship um so the reason we don't like job titles and it it's only between dom and i so within yeah. our team everybody's got job titles um and despite us having two very different roles within what we do again as you've clearly seen over the last half an hour very different people um, react to chaos in completely different ways. The reason we always have the same job title, no matter what we're doing, it removes any form of hierarchy or ego. Right. Um, and it's something that even though Dom might be clearly is much more technical, I'm more sort of sales operationally focused. Mm. We will always make the same decision. We'll always make a joint decision. And we won't proceed with anything unless we're both 100% committed to it. Yeah. Um, and externally, the easiest way to convey that to other people is to have exactly the same job title, mm -hmm. even though we do completely different things. So yeah. Dom and I will separately have our own. Um, we don't really have job descriptions, but we sort of define our responsibilities as to what's mine and what's Dom's. Um, but externally to the team, to anybody that we're working with, we are always aligned. We're always joined at the hip, um, even though behind the scenes we may not be. Yeah, fair enough. Now, are you like Anton Deck in that you always have to stand in the same place? <laughs> not so much stand in the same place, but um, my name's always got to go before Don's. And that is purely 
before Dom barks up about the ego. That's purely because I'm the oldest. And I know right. it's hard to believe. I know it's hard to believe. Um, but that's the way it should be. Yeah, quite right. <laughs> Whereas in my, I work with my brother. My brother's older than me. But we're really clear in that I'm in charge. Okay. So we, we yeah. definitely have, because he would hate to be in charge. And that, that's purely, yeah, he doesn't want to do that. He's really happy. He loves the fact that we call him the show pony. And, and he goes out and he does all the performing because he's yep. really, really good at that and in public speaking and all the rest of it. And I'm much happier doing the driving the business and, and doing all of that stuff. So it's really good you two have found your roles and found a way to work with each other happily, which I think is is half the battle when you work with your family, definitely. All right. Oh, without question. Yeah. Yeah. Without question. Yeah, and, I, and I think we're both happy to muck in, in each other's side of the business when we have to as well, yeah. um, which which is also like really helpful. Yeah. Now, are you allowed to go on holiday at the same time or do you have to, you know, separate things like that out as well? Good question. Uh, yeah, we have done. We have done. Yeah. Funnily enough, we don't we don't coordinate that well. But the last two <laughs> two times I've flown back the day he's flying out. Right. Um, okay. And we, we haven't even coordinated. Um, no. It's just happened naturally. So um, generally we, we sort of take it in turns um, to have time off. Um just because otherwise it, it could be too too chaotic. Um, yeah. But we, we have taken holiday at the same time. Yeah, well, we went we've gone on holiday together as well. well yeah, well, yeah. how mad is that? So we go and relax, get away from work, and you're, uh, you're sat on a sunbed next to your, your brother, your, your colleague. <laughs> but we're, what, what is with that, though? We are quite strict on when to talk about work and when not to talk about yeah. work. And I think people find it weird that, we genuinely do have like a brother mate type relationship as well as a business relationship. Yeah. Um, so genuinely enjoy spending time with Dom, like outside of work and socializing. We've got sport that we enjoy doing together. There's exercise that we enjoy doing together. So it very much is sort of like a layered relationship. Mm -hmm. You know, when to, when to turn it on and, you know, from Friday through to Sunday evening, yeah. There won't be any conversation whatsoever about about work because we both respect each other's time. Totally. Yeah, me and my brother, we have the same rules, definitely. And it, it works. It works really well. So let's go back to social chaps because yep. you, you said it's kind of evolved. But how did it begin in the first place? Dom? <laughs> yeah. So, um, so social chaps have sort of begun out of um, something that, me and Elle were doing beforehand. So I was running a tech startup um, in the sort of recruitment or recruitment technology space. Um, so I'd raised um, and I was trying to figure out how to get in the room with HR directors, recruitment, agency owners, um, and yeah, engaged a few marketing agencies, engage, engaged a few sort of different types of consultancies. And I was quite young and inexperienced at the time. Um, so just thought, give it to them. They don't know what they're doing you know, pay them a fee and they'll get me in the room. That didn't quite happen. Um, so sort of fired those people and decided to start to figure it out myself. Um, with that, I built a bit of a system within within STEMX. Um, and I was working with Al, so we shared an office in Bournemouth. Um, so we would be working together on this little system and I was testing it with STEMX, I was testing it with South Coast Network. Al was involved in the, in the family business. Um, and over probably a period of six to nine months, we got this uh, system working, which was you sort of put the data in the top end, um, worked really hard on sort of the copy and the strategy. Um, and then leads would sort of come out the, come out the other side. Um, so we built this system internally. Um, I then, we, well, we both went, went on to exit um, and yeah, that was sort of how social chats begun. But even at that point, we didn't realize that was the product or the service. Um, we, were, we were using that to find another, you know, find clients, but we didn't know. We almost didn't know what we were going to do for those clients at that point. Um, no. And now you can talk about sort of South Coast Network and your, your perspective on it. 
Yeah, so similar, obviously, sharing an office. Um, the only thing I'd probably add to what Don was saying was I experienced the same thing with a marketing agency, right. and we were both sort of bitching about having bad results and a bad experience and um, not quite getting what we expected. So I just added fuel to the fire, really, rather than any major solutions. But we were very much the guinea pigs of our own source. You know, we took our own medicine and that helped us from a consultancy double the size of the business. We went from two and a half million turnover to over five and a half million a pound a year turnover. And at which point I was very happy to walk away and uh, and say goodbye to consultancy life. That was a, a transition into what was then social chaps. But even at that point, we'd both exited roughly at the same time. It was strategic in that we were both we both knew that we were exiting. We both knew that we wanted to maybe try something else. We'd enjoyed this project. We tried other failed ventures um, previously. So we knew that we were going to do something, but I don't think we realized that it was going to turn into, I don't think anybody does really, but it, we did, definitely didn't foresee it turning into what it is today. One of the things that we did say is we never wanted to have any employees. Yes. Um, and that that quickly went out the window after four weeks. Right. When our sister, um, the business was growing quite quickly. It was maybe a little bit longer than four weeks. It was probably about six months, actually. Um, business was doing well. We were about to take on our first employee, somebody else. It's about eight o'clock at night. And our sister, Sammy, called me and was like, I'm leaving my job. I'm out. Um, I need a job. I'm like, I, can you do what we need you to do? She's like, no, but I'm I'm out. Like, I need. She just she uh, she was just going back off the maternity with a with her first child. Called up Dom. I was like, we're in a bit of a situation here. We've got to hire Sammy. I was like, I don't think she can do the job. I was like, I know, but we we've just got to hire her. Otherwise, we're going to get a load of grief from mum and dad, and it's just not worth it. <laughs> hire her. If it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Um, hired her the next day and um, I'm sure Don would agree probably one of the best hires we've made she's been oh. um, unbelievable four years five years down the line she's still with us uh, in a slightly different role Miss Reliable yeah Miss Reliable yeah um, oh. so it's very much within the family and uh, again no real plans to do that definitely didn't want to hire her um, yeah. and openly would say that to her yeah regularly do say that to her just reminding her that uh you know she's very lucky <laughs> but it's worked out well it's worked out well i love that and i love the fact that you kind of fell over the idea for the business yeah uh, we, we've all been let down by marketing agencies i remember very clearly paying two and a half thousand pounds a month for somebody to produce a blog a month, which turned out to be the one blog that was downgrading us on SEO. Um, <laughs> yeah, efficient. <laughs> yeah, it was like, yay, never doing that again. Um, so I love the fact that you've combined this lead generation with actually working really closely with the businesses. And that, like you say, that 360, that holistic view, because actually that's what business development and lead generation is about, isn't it? And how has that led on to other businesses then? Dom? Yeah, good question. Um, so I think, so we, we acquired Speak on Podcasts um, in December um, of last year, which is obviously how we're sort of here today. Yeah. Um, but we we wanted to implement a sort of a B2B system that we'd be working on, sort of a B2B marketing and sales system that we'd been working on and twink, uh, sort of tinkering for a while, which sort of hits all the elements of how to engage a prospect at every sort of area. So getting your CRM set up right, getting your lead generation set up right, getting your SEO and inbound set up correctly, and then doing sort of events, online events, content like podcasting, and sort of turning it into like something which efficient is sort of really efficient um, and actually produces results instead of again, as you've been there, put out like one or two blogs, four social media posts, and just hope for the best. Yeah. Everything that we do is to engage a prospect at a certain area of their their journey. Um, so we implemented that. And it was a complete success. Um, and Speak On Podcast continues to sort of grow. Uh, and then we decided to roll that out across other businesses. Um, 
And yeah, so far it's a, it's a success. Um, it's a lot of work, but we're in, so we're enjoying it at the moment. Yeah. At the moment. Yeah. yeah, well, that, that's good. So <laughs> there we are. <laughs> and aren't you also investors as well? Yeah, so we've invested into four other agencies. Okay. Um, a couple we knew, so a couple were former clients, um, so we knew them quite well. We said, listen, this is what we're looking to do. This, we've got this system. We are looking for a small number of agencies that we know we love to work with where we can actually invest in you, become part shareholder, align ourselves to your vision, which is potentially to, to exit in a number of years. And in doing so, the value that we're going to give and we're going to bring is exactly the system that Dom just um, just explained. So it's, yep, yeah, here we go. We want to invest in you. But one of the, I guess there's sort of parameters on the, the types of agencies, but also the types of people that we want to invest into. So our sweet spot is breaking through the one million revenue a year barrier, which yeah. a lot of agencies really struggle with. Yeah, they do. Um, and the majority of the agencies, if not all of the agencies that we've invested in, are sort of sitting just south of that and have tried one or two times to try and break through and have struggled to actually break through. What we really focus our energy on is, are you set up from a lead gen perspective, a growth perspective, mm -hmm. but also what's the impact on the team? If we go from 750 year one to 1 1.5 year two, what's then the impact across the business? So it's not only that, growth element but it's also that advisory consultancy here's the systems here's everything you need in place Great. Um, so that's we have there was no design for us to do this we've very much we are constantly failing and stumbling our way through our entrepreneurial journey and i even sort of slightly cringe at the thought of even being an entrepreneur um <laughs> I'm not sure what I'm, you are if you're not entrepreneurs. I'm not quite sure either. I, I don't want to. I don't want to put a label on it. No, but it's, okay. we are very much sort of fumbling our way through our business careers. I think that's fair to say. Yeah, I, don't you think though? Most people are just we're just making it up as we go along. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. I think there's so much of a stigma around trying to appear like a polished or the you know the polished version of yourself online. No. Um, which is certainly not what we are. No. Very well polished. And I don't, you two are clearly younger than me. Let's not go down that road. But <laughs> I, I think I've reached an age where that wanting to appear polished, I've just forgotten about because I, I know I just can't, yeah. you know, because we are all making it up. I've been in business for 30 years now and I'm still making it up because I'm running a completely different business to the one I was 30 years ago, completely yep. different. Um, and actually, I think that is the very nature of growing businesses. Even you know, what some of my clients are architects, they know architecture inside out and back to front, but what they don't know is how to run a 10 million pound business because up until now, they've only run a four million and a six million pound business. Yeah, completely it's, different. It's completely different. It's yeah. totally yeah. different. Um, right. But if so what, go on. No, no, I was just going to say, if you're not constantly sort of failing, adapting, somewhat tweaking, yeah. um, well, you, you will be. Like, whether it's in life, whether it's in business, you, you just naturally are because the person that you are at 25 is not the person you are at 35 and circumstances change. But I think one of the things that we we do across our companies, and we actually included this in our sort of takeover speech of Speak On Podcasts, mm -hmm. is getting comfortable with being uncomfortable. If yeah. you're super uncomfortable, it typically means you're doing something to better yourself or to grow. Even if it's not an enjoyable scenario, you will yeah. be better off for it. So, um, yeah, that's something that we try and live by. So podcasting i've been doing it for gosh probably three years now and mainly because i just like it and i'm really nosy and i just want to ask entrepreneurs about what they're up to um but there's there's a kind of there's a definite commercial benefit isn't there that i'm probably blissfully unaware of but what what's happening in the podcasting world what are the trends what can it do for a business so I'll let Dom talk more about more around the actual hosting side because you're probably cool. slightly closer to it. So from a 
Speak on Podcasts, which is the agency that we that we bought. We focus on getting business owners, uh, typically business owners or business leaders, mm. onto shows like yourself. So hence why Dom and I are here. The commercial benefit of that, there's a number of different benefits. We get exposure to your audience. Yeah. So if we've got some message or something that we want to try and get across, we are essentially pig and piggybacking off the back of other hosts' audience. You can also spin this into content and a complete content arm of your business mm-hmm. and essentially build a little media suite. So every mm-hmm. single recording, every single sound bite, you can then snip that into you know, a one minute clip or a reel or whatever you want to do onto LinkedIn, Instagram, TikTok, wherever it wants, and just add that to the media center that you're building or the lead generation engine that you're trying to build as well. Mm-hmm. So it is very much, I we describe it internally as sort of new age PR, you know, right. 15, 20 years ago, if you wanted to get your yourself out there, like really, really out there, you'd do something in print, you do something on TV, you do something on radio. What we're able to do and what this is, because this will no doubt go onto YouTube. Most podcasts are being pushed onto YouTube. Yeah. You've got that long form content as well as all the short form content. You can also turn this into blogs, into articles, and there's AI tools out there that are doing that for you as well. So from a guesting perspective, and it's similar to the hosting, there are huge commercial value to, to appearing as a guest. Yeah, brilliant. Dom, come yeah. in on the podcast. Yeah. <laughs> Well, the, the only thing I would add to it, and I think there's there's values, and we were actually I was actually consulting with a, a current client whether to go and start guesting or start their own podcast and the difference in price. Um, and he wants to sort of start his own podcast, um, which I think is great. Um, and it's I, for me the benefits are, are around building sort of deep relationships with influential people. Um, you know, you get your twenty minutes, half an hour before you get. 15 minutes after you get an hour on the podcast and then there's all the, you know, everything that comes after it. I think yeah. it's a, it's a great way to sort of build relationships with people who you want as future clients. Yeah. Um, so that's why he's building it. And then again, similar to, to L, I think the, you know, if anyone has ever seen sort of the, the Gary V content model podcast and it's perfect for it, it allows you to do everything you want with just one podcast a week or even yeah. a couple of podcasts a month um for me the you know if the audience comes and people listen that's an additional bonus um Mm. but for me the the real value in sort of smaller podcasts is you know content creation building real relationships um and you know for me they're the they're the two key things um Mm. a lot of our a lot of the people we've got on podcasts have often they've often turned into business relationships and I'm sure that's happened with you as well. Yeah. Um, as, as it is happening with us um, at the moment. So yeah, for me, for me, they're the key things from a, I guess the smaller podcast space or the sort of um, the business to business podcast. Whereas, you know, if you're getting put on your, your Stephen Bartlett's and your Joe Rogan's of the world, I think that's a whole different yeah. medium All and in. space. Yeah. It's a whole different medium and space. He, I think he has a team of 25 behind him. 40. Um, 40. 40? Yeah. 40. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I don't, I don't feel quite as bad now. <laughs> it's like me and my two dogs. That, <laughs> <yeah>. Co hosts. <laughs> Co hosts. They appear regularly. Uh, yeah. I do have some help with the edit, but that that's it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, go on. Oh, no, no, I, I think that medium in terms of high-end production podcasts with influential or celebrities, um, yeah, where that goes, I, I'm quite intrigued, but I can see that mm-hmm. moving more to sort of the likes of TV interviews, which is how it yeah. feels now. Yeah. Um, or like Piers Morgan life stories sort of 10 years ago. That's sort of yeah. what it feels like now. Got um, a little throwback there, Dom. Yeah, a little throwback. <laughs> um, yeah. Do you know, it's really that's funny. That's... I, I like Joe Rogan, but it depends on the guest he's got. So I'll only Indeed. listen to him when I've got a guest that I really, really want to listen to. Um, the rest of it, I kind of, I don't like celebrity podcasts. The only one I listen to that 
is remotely a celebrity podcast is Chris and Rosie Ramsey, Shag Married Annoyed. And that's yep. just because it's it's really rude. It's funny. And funny. Yeah. Um, and they don't behave like celebrities. Yeah. For me, kind of podcasting is very much about, you know, ordinary people opening a window into their little world. Yeah. And that's what I like about it. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. Dom and I, Dom and I actually had our own podcast before we realised how much work was involved. Um, right. Dived in um, probably about four or five years ago, and we were we were interviewing um, just fascinating people. There was no yeah. consensus. It was people who have got a story, but yeah. specifically not celebrities. Yeah, um, like there were there were sort of some that were on the cusp of being celebrities. Yeah. I definitely wouldn't class them as celebrities. And if they're listening, no offense. Um, <laughs> then they won't be listening, but you never know. Um, but it's, 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 no, they won't be listening. Um, but it's that, that so everybody's got something to, to give. Everybody's got a story, whether it's good, whether it's bad, whether it's emotional, whether it's, um, you know, influential, whatever it might be. And I agree with you, Rebecca, like the more enjoyable podcasts are probably mm -hmm. the less polished less edited just raw conversations yeah totally have you come across a podcast called fred the head i haven't fred the head. no i haven't okay is that Look a recommendation up. yeah it is um i got i i had to listen to all 43 episodes in about a two month period because i got so obsessed with it um it's who who killed fred the head Look it okay up. Great. anyway i ended up doing a podcast with the guy who records that podcast because he actually also runs a business. He doesn't do the podcast to earn any money and he runs a business. So I interviewed him about that. But yeah, it leads you down some really interesting alleys. Anyway, listen, where are you taking these businesses? What's the grand plan, chaps? Uh, good question. Um, so <laughs> each business has one thing that's important to mention is each business are completely separate. So we're not doing a merger. We're not doing a roll up. A lot of people naturally assume that we are sort of smashing these businesses together. I've done mergers in the past. I'm never doing one ever again. They are messy and I'm just not putting myself through that. So each individual business is completely independent. There is some sort of crossover. Everybody knows that we're working together. There's some cross collaboration. We've done days where we get people in the same room and do like a sort of a whiteboard strategy session on best practices within certain parts of the business. But they are completely independent, purposely. And each company has a different goal. But for us, it is to get each company to a specific target that we've already set and sell. Simple as that. We want to get it to a certain point and eventually exit. Great. Great. Love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. I'm going to pick one. I'm going to pick one. Of them. Quite, quite right. You've got to have an exit strategy. I don't care what your exit strategy is. You've got to have one. You've got to build towards something. Yeah. doesn't matter what it is, but you've got to build towards something. I quite agree. Okay. It's having that North so Star. I'm going to uh, absolutely and people go well, why why do you want me to plan my exit well because otherwise you'll make decisions now that mean in 15 years time you end up over here somewhere where you yeah. actually meant to end up over here and you'll yep. be really miserable so unless you plan where you're heading you could end up nowhere yeah. nice and doom and gloom totally. there i like that totally. right let's take so <laughs> yeah I'm a mank. I've got a black sense of humour. Um, so well, let's take social chap. I'm mainly taking that business because that's the one that, that's been around the longest. If yep. that had a personality or a character, how would you describe it? Wow. That is a question perfectly set up for Dom to answer. Go for it, Dom. Is that because you don't know the answer, Elliot? Yeah, so so, yeah. When, so whenever Earl doesn't know the answer, he pushes on to me and I have to fumble around an answer until he comes up with the right one. Every time. Um, I had noticed that. But I think the thing with social apps is a really easy one in terms of personality because, because actually we didn't really build social chaps to to exit as such. 
the personality and okay. what social apps is 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 me and L. Um, and it has been sort of its own to its own sort of detriment that we built it that way. Um, and we are sort of working hard on that at the moment to to change to change it slightly, uh, to give it a bit more um, of a North Star and, and switch it up. But yeah, the, the personality of Social Chaps is definitely from me and Elsa. It's very, you know, led on relationships. Um, a lot of a lot of people these days, especially in agencies, they'll stick to Slack, they'll stick to email, um, whereas we're very much pick up the phone if there's an issue, um, figure it out, take people out for some breakfast, coffees, lunches, actually build real deep relationships um, and understand the, the yeah. sort of the end goal of what the project is, um, yeah. which again yeah. is a bit of a difficulty when you're trying to pass clients on to other people um and they always end up calling you back because you know you've built a friendship almost with those guys so um yeah El, you've, you've probably had enough time now go on well I, I was actually amazed how you fumbled your way through that that was go on Elliot. I so i haven't necessarily thought of a character but i was going to counter what don was saying around um it being sort of limiting because a lot of the things that we've done beyond social chaps have been because of those relationships that we've created. And it's, so, I guess we're sort of that, I don't know whether we're that, whether COVID changed it or what, but there is a reluctancy to meet people face to face in the business world that we're in today, because the technology is now there to not be able to, but you don't create deep relationships in my opinion, without consistently looking into the whites of somebody's eyes. And I am a big believer in whether it's lunch, coffee, dinner, beers, whatever it is, having that two, three hours where you're getting to know somebody intimately over a period of time is much more valuable than consistent half an hour Zooms. Thanks for listening, everybody. Did you know at TriCress, we've built a kick-ass culture coach and consultant program. So if you're a business coach or consultant and you're looking for something new, add to your toolbox or even escape the nine to five, join us at our next event. Links in the information on the podcast. See you there. The Entrepreneurial Journey Podcast. We're talking business and building a culture that's kick-ass.